All right. We are live. Okay. Hello, hello. How are you? Doing very good. Ready to go. Brian, five, four, three, two, one. I counted back from five. <laughs> <laughs> You're not good at following directions. No, I'm not. <laughs> Wanted to be heard a little longer. Kira, three, two, one. Joshua, five, four, three, two, one. Both of you guys. That was me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. I did something right today. Hey, we want to take a, can we take a break at 25 after? Okay. I appreciate it. We'll do it. Thanks. But, but you didn't pass the test. <laughs> What's the emoji doubt? Okay. <laughs> she go, she may go out a little earlier. <laughs> Why do I put up with this? Oh, because you love us. Mm. There you go. That's my part, though. <laughs> They're going to need me for that part <laughs> the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Teach you to be smart, huh? Yes. <laughs> I may not be smart by sharing I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I resemble that remark. We <laughs> keep going all day long. <laughs> we forget about the show. We're in here just chatting away, making all this stuff. Nobody can hear the engineer, so they're all going, what the heck? All right, anyone joining us? Okay. Catch a card, Mark. Welcome everyone to Tame the Wild. I'm joined in the studio with my wife, Kira. Oh, she's so good to have along. She just passed the pre-radio show test. I did. I was the only one that passed too. Yeah, the other dunce in the room, Joshua, <laughs> he and I failed it. So I, I can't promise how good the show is going to be today. But hey, we're excited to have you guys. Uh, you know, in the little introduction there that you listen to before the show comes on, talks about being an expert and everything. Well, we're not so sure about that, but I'll tell you this much. We make an effort to uncover fact. And now what you do with it, that's really up to you. But whenever we see something out there in the dog ownership world that it, we feel is either A, flat out incorrect, B, sensationalized, uh, you name it, we're going to bring it to your attention because some of these are very harmful, some not so harmful. Uh, I, today could go either way. And we were talking about some examples before even the show uh, where that goes. But today we got a lot of stuff going on where you're a, we're going to talk about a, an article that was in a magazine that has declared that your dog can tell if you're rude, if you're nasty, if you're just a darn outright mean person. Horrible. Didn't it say a well, horrible person? Like Joshua said, if we, it, you know, we could rent dogs out uh, right, to yeah, people like first date here, first take this date dog, dog with you. Yeah. <laughs> just, you can rent our first date dog, you know, the, check out your landlord or your tenant or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. It's going there. So I there's a market for that. For Hang sure. in there. We'll let you know here in a second. What we found out about this little research is the article true or again, has this thing been sensationalize. Well, we'll let you know. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about dog depression. Uh, just briefly, there was a question that was asked last week and I promised I'd go into it a little bit more detailed. In other words, can dogs suffer from depression? And then we've got some good questions this week, Kara. Always, always uh, good yeah, questions. It's amazing. Keep them coming. 
Yeah, please do. You people write in uh, very, very good questions. And if we never answer your questions only because we thought it was stupid, but anyway, we didn't want to embarrass you on the on the radio show. <laughs> you know uh, that doesn't Yeah, happen. you know I mean? We, I just play around a lot and keep, keep it light there. But we do have a little bit of a serious subject here. So let's talk about it. Okay, in a recent uh, article in a magazine that came out in August, uh, again, Country Living, the dogs we love, uh, I promise Country Living, I'm going to quit picking on you because you have some very, very good articles in this magazine, but boy, you have a couple of doozies that we just kind of need to go over real quick. I don't know if you are looking to just fill some space, but let's talk about it. So anyway, there's a little section in, in the article uh, that says, or the title is, Trust Their Instincts. And without reading the whole thing, it says that research was done uh, recently, which a mistake number one. And it said that the research was able to conclude that uh, they were looking forward to see if dogs were capable of recognizing whether someone is a nice person. And during the test, they discovered that these clever creatures use this information to decide how they respond to someone, including you, the owner, if you're the one who's being a bit rude. And then finally, he says, scientists concluded that dogs are able to tell if someone is being nasty, uh, if they're being rude, and then judge them accordingly. Okay, so we have a lot of human-like characteristics. Nasty. So we'd have to define that. Being a bad person. Hmm. Rude. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of behaviors that we see with dogs that we would you know, we voice out immediately and say, wow, that was rude. When you butt the other guy out in line for your treat, or you steal their treat, so on and so forth. But again, we always have to be so careful about over anthropomorphizing these creatures, because again, at the end of the day, when you do, you fall into a, the rabbit hole. And now all of a sudden we expect more from animals than what they're capable of giving. Well, let's even talk about what is rude. Okay, so us humans can't even decide on the the parameters of what rude means. I mean, what culture you're in depends on how you behave is is whether it's rude or not. I mean, in, in Asian culture, you're not even allowed to hand somebody something that's older than you with one hand. You have to use two hands to, to hand it over to them, and that's considered rude if you don't do so. So in what culture is the dog judging whether you're rude or not? Is that why they shake my hand with two hands? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, we get all day long. Again, we we're talking, I was talking to Kira when I was doing research on this article. If our teenager does not offer to help do the dishes after dinner, is he a bad person or is he just being lazy? He's just a teenager. Yeah, he's a teenager. So he, he, yeah, he's all the above. No, he's just lazy. So again, um, yeah, let, so let's move on from there. Anytime we look at research, we always have to keep a few things in mind. Number one, there's a credo that you, if you don't have this in your head, then you have no business doing research. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So again, that's to, that's to keep an open mind. So you don't go in with this narrow mind. You're open-minded. Just because you didn't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And the other one is, uh, I love this quote from Warner Heisenberger, and it came out in the year in which I was born. So it was a little while ago, but it still holds true today. What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And that always has to be into, taken into account. What was the bias of the person doing the research, so on and so forth? What were they looking for? And let's call into question, how did they dig for this information? You always have to keep these in mind. Otherwise, you'll, you'll go off the, the beaten path there. So this article uh, was referring to research that was done by the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Sciences in Kyoto uh, University Graduate School in Japan. It was done in about mid-2016, and it was published in early January uh, 2017. So it's dated a little bit. So it wasn't a recent article. And the research uh, paper was termed third-party social evaluations of humans by monkeys and dogs. Now you wonder, okay, well, what motivated you to do this? Why, why do you need to study and spend time on third-party social evaluations of humans by monkeys and dogs? Well, they, the monkeys they were referring to are Capuchin monkeys, and they're very social. They have an incredible, incredibly complex social order, social uh, uh, colonies that they exist in. So that's a really good choice. And being a primate, uh, you can definitely pick up 
a lot of useful information because they're closest to, uh, they're behaviorally closest to humans. But they also dragged in dogs into the uh, research. And what they were looking for was to determine the possibility of an innate moral core. In other words, are you born with a moral core? core. And they were studying this in infants. And they, infants are able to tell if someone is rude or, or just acting in a way that is not contributing to the colony, contributing to the pack, to the uh, family unit. Uh, absolutely. A, a young wolf cub can do this. A young dog pup can tell who's providing what, because why that's Again, well, actually, I, I won't say that because that could give away my conclusion here at the end. <laughs> so don't let, me, don't let me jump ahead of myself here. But that's what they were looking for. And they wanted to know, do other species show signs of a moral core in the absence of likely human unique traits such as language? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, if you think that's interesting, let's go for it. So they did. And they studied, uh, did a lot of uh, little uh, trials with the capuchin monkeys and with children. And then they added in the domestic dog. And in these studies, there was two different trials. And one of these, you had three human beings and they were kneeling on the floor. The person in the middle was the dog's owner. And the dog was held by a researcher one meter away from his owner. All of them were again, kneeling on the floor, taking the exact same posture. The difference in trial one, the owner of the dog was holding a container, a container that inside the container was a rolled up ball of tape. But why that was there, they don't go on to explain that. But nevertheless, it was a container. And he was supposed to act as though for 30 seconds, I can't open the container. So now one of the actors is the helper. The other actor is the non-helper and the helper turns to the owner of the dog and assists him in opening the container. Once that's accomplished, then the owner sets the container on the floor in front of where he is kneeling. The helper actor now lays down, bows forward and extends their arms with their head to the ground, not looking at the dog. So does the non-helper. So while the owner is kneeling, upright, they are lying on the ground with their arms extended with a treat in it. So that's trial one. Trial two, same group of people, non-helper, dog's owner, helper. But in this instance, the owner tries to open the container, but instead of the helper turning to assist, she simply turned her head away and she did not assist. Then the container was placed on the ground. And then again, they, the both of them, they, uh, they're both non-helpers in this case, would lie down on the floor, heads to the ground, extending their arms forward with a treat held in their hands. Um, must have been an old treat because they used both of their hands. So the treat must have been older than them. <laughs> and this was in Japan. So this was, was Asian, in Japan. Asian. <laughs> there you go. All hands. right. So they did that. And then at the end of the, the study here, here was the results. And I'll just read it right. This is right from the published paper. Once uh, the, they had taken up their positions, their final positions in both trials, the dog was released and allowed to approach. Neither the actor nor the neutral person looked at the dog either during the demonstration or the choice phase. The dog's choice, this is important. Now listen to this. The dog's choice was the first person, actor or neutral actor, that it approached to sniff, lick, or take the food from. Okay, so you got that. They don't, so therefore, there's no mention of what the dog did what it did for a second or what, what was the second choice and less and even with chance, meaning 50% of the time, 18 dogs involved in the trial, they went to the helper in the first trial, 50% did not. In the second trial, one went to the helper, the rest of them did not. So in the less than even Chance, less than chance is what they call it. And in, uh, in the first scenario is more of a chance result. There's a chance that this could occur, it couldn't. So basically 50 50. 
Uh, and when they did this, they concluded the studies reviewed here have shown that like young human children, monkeys and pet dogs are not merely passive observers and other individuals interactions. Instead, in some circumstances, at least, they pay attention to the outcome of the interaction, evaluate how the actors behave, and make use of that information in reaching a decision about which individuals to interact with or to avoid. Okay, so it's not talking about judging, about a moral code. What they were able to conclude was whether the dog would act or, or interact or not interact with either of the actors. And here's my, my big question about this whole study, uh, or, or where I find some fault, uh, maybe a little, some steps that weren't accurately provided uh, or weren't added to the test, but, or just simply overlooked. But number one, these are animals. They don't have language. So they're very in tune to body English. And the number one thing that they're in tune to is energy, cost versus benefit. I don't care how fearful you may be as a human or an animal, you still need food. You need food. That's the synthesis for more energy. So therefore, it's always going to be the number one thing that animals look for, any source of food. So this container, where are treats normally kept, Josh? Where, where do we normally keep treats? In a container. In a container. It could be a cardboard box. It could be a Tupperware <laughs> container like the one that was used in this research. You know, treat bags, you name it. But typically, they're in a container. Even cheese. We go to the refrigerator. We get out a pack of those American singles. And lo and behold, if Kira asked me, hey, Brian, can you help me open this little package here? It's stuck guarantee you the dogs come to both of us every time both of us but again if our teenager was in the same kitchen not handling the cheese in any sort of way the dogs don't give him even a sideways glance so again we have a container that looks like it has treats and that's affirmed by the dogs because when they do make an approach lo and behold someone has a treat uh so therefore you know, part of this is I think someone's holding my owner, that is, the person in the middle is holding a treat container. And the person next to them is also holding that treat container. So there's a high likelihood that if there are treats involved, it's those two, not the other human being who's doing nothing, not looking at me, not moving a muscle whatsoever. And again, we're withheld the information on what happened with the second choice. So that's a little bit of a fault there. Uh, maybe you could have used a different type of device. Uh, I, I guarantee there's a lot of different ways that this study could have been done and probably would have come up with different results. Also, what is the history of the animal receiving treats from families and friends of the owner? Does the owner ever, has the owner ever with these dogs, these 18 dogs, said, here, Kira, give my dog a treat. Hey, Joshua, will you throw a treat at my dog over here? So... Again, none of that was mentioned. So I don't know if they took that into account or not. But no way do they, they arrive at a conclusion that dogs can tell whether someone is nice. No, they can tell whether someone possibly has a treat and someone doesn't. There's something going on. Uh, you have three dogs in the yard. Two of them are digging a hole at the same hole. They're, they're digging and scruffing in the ground. One is lying a short distance away in the sun. Introduce a fourth dog into that group. And I guarantee you, you will have a better than even chance that that dog will go and investigate. What are those other two dogs doing? What happens to be so wonderful that you guys feel like you need to dig to get it? And again, that goes back to my mitochondrial DNA with my ancestor who will uh, scavenge for food, dig holes for a mole uh, to, to eat. And I'm just going to go over there and see if I can get something to eat. Again, cost versus benefit. I grab out a bag of potato chips. It doesn't matter if Kira's sitting at the table or not. It doesn't matter how many people are at my table. Kira, where are all four of our dogs? 
sitting right at your feet, looking up, yep. waiting. Yep. I like to think that my wife is a nice person, at least most of the time. And so she's seated at the table. We have nice people at the table. I leave the bag of potato chips on the table and I walk away. Where do the dogs go, Kira, when I walk away? They stay at the table where the chips are. <laughs> yes. They stay at the table where the chips are. So whether you grab the chips or not, I want to be where the chips are. But even if Kira's at a distance and I grab chips out, I walk away, then they will follow me because I'm holding the, the chips. Ch they'll go all the way upstairs. All the way upstairs. Following you. <laughs> everywhere we go. So guys, you know, you can kind of take from this what you wish out of it, if this helps you or not. But I, from reading this and from my years of working with animals at all levels, wild animals, domesticated animals, marine animals, I'm here to tell you. This thing is flawed from the minute go. No wonder it never advanced beyond the stage. No wonder there was no follow-up research done. You can no more conclude from this study that dogs can tell if someone is naughty or nice, if they're nasty, if they're rude. Dogs don't know that part. They judge by action. They literally judge the book by its cover. Joshua, how many times have I walked into a room a waiting room to receive my client with their dog. I've never met either one of them. And I'm growled at. <laughs> you work with fearful and aggressive dogs. So quite often. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But even when yeah, I don't. Yeah. yeah. And how many yeah. times have you been growled? Yeah. At? Quite often. Yeah. And Kira is you as well. Once or twice. I consider and myself to be and nice. all of you who are listening, how many times have you visited someone's home and the dog growled at you? They don't know you. How can they judge you? You're just standing there. You're saying, hi, hey, how you guys doing? And, yeah, maybe it's because I'm six foot two. Maybe it's because I'm wearing a black t-shirt on that day. Maybe it's because I have a bit of an attitude that says, hey, dog, I love you, but please don't bite me. Uh, I don't know. It, it can be many, many things. My father-in-law is one of the kindest, most generous human beings I've ever met in my life. And yet our Siberian Husky Takani just about three months ago when my father-in-law came over, he growled at him. He growled, and all he was doing was just reaching down to want to pet him. He just wanted to give him a little scratch on the noggin. So just, yeah, there you go. There's my answer. No, wrong. They, they even admit that's not the conclusion that they came up with. And shame on the magazine for sensationalizing this and giving misinformation and coming to conclusions that the researchers did not come to. And if you knew a thing or two about animal behavior, you would realize what was going on here, where there were, where their flaws were in this research. And now I sure hope, you know, you, you had an example and you don't have to get real personal until mm -hmm. you can just kind of skirt around it. Yep. But you, you came in contact with this kind of uh, where you had this uh, uh, perception that dogs can tell if someone's nice or not, if they're a good person or not. Yeah. So my, my wife had a friend and um, long story short later, it very much turned out that this friend was not a good person in any way, shape or form. But before that came to light, my wife's dog was obsessed with this person. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely adored him. But, uh, but she was always, you know, thought that was a good thing, but then come to find out the, the person was not that good of a person at all in any way, shape or form. And then we were starting going, well, maybe dogs don't really know who good or bad people are because this dog obviously had no idea. Yeah. So it's, again, we can sit here all day long and, and, throw out one example after another. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to you to, if it makes you happy, you want to trust your dog in that way, fine. But let me tell you this much. Don't let it lead you down into trouble. Please don't assume more than what you should. It is an animal. It doesn't have language. Therefore, it learns with its eyes, then a sense of touch, first and second, smell and hearing, distance third and fourth. This is how they learn. Because if you don't have language, you have to study. And if I'm going to study something, number one, I'm going to study, can I get food from that thing, from that situation? Number two, is it a threat? Then I need to get out of here because it doesn't matter how much food I get. If I'm dead, then who cares? That's the priority. Then after that, come, it now starts to go down the road of reproduction. How do I acquire offspring? And then how do I acquire a safe dwelling place for my offspring? So on and so forth. So again, I always tell people, embrace what you have. When we start, gosh, when, when articles like this come out, they just make people believe that they, again, own a little person in a fur coat. And gosh, you know, that's fun. 
I, I tell people all the time, we do it on occasion, of course. We do. We, we have fun with it. You know, I mean, Halloween's coming up. We already just talked to someone this morning. They're talking about all these little Halloween pageants that are going to be going on and who can dress up and look like their dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some people I'm thinking, you know, you don't need to dress up to have that, that happen. <laughs> but it's, this is fun, fun, but draw the line at the end of the fun because you're disrespecting your dog and you're not doing it any service at all, when you think it can think like you, when you think it can judge good people and make them bad, you are now expecting more from your dog than it's capable of giving. And when that happens, both in the human realm and the animal realm, the outcome is often far worse than had you not judged that. There, you're going to have more of a bad outcomes happening than you're going to have good outcomes. I have a 360 view question for you, Brian. Um, so knowing the ability of dogs sense of smell, looking at, you know, the, their ability to detect, you know, minor changes in cortical, cortical steroid changes in your body and, and glucose levels for diabetic, um, patients, is there any chance that dogs would be able to sense the, the, cause you know, when you lie or you have ill intentions, your heart rate increases and you start to sweat more, perspirate and things like that. Is there a way that a dog would have a different reaction to somebody who's going through those chemical changes versus somebody who is not? Oh, absolutely. They can smell it. Uh, I, I always use the little example back in the day we had the mood rings and the mood stones. So, Hey, hey if I'm dating myself again, I always do it. If you can remember those, how did those react? It was a the chemical reaction to your body having a chemical reaction to a change in your emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, whether your stress response has been mobilized, if it has, absolute known fact. In fact, I'm going to talk about that when we come back from a break. What happens to your body? What happens to your dog's body when the stress response has been mobilized? So you bet they can smell if someone's afraid. They can smell if someone is suffering from a low blood sugar, uh, if they're about to have a seizure, if they have a tumor in their body, so on and so forth. So yeah, there's many clues that they, they operate off of. But I tell you what, guys, we are going to take a short break and we come back, we'll wrap this little thing up here, and then I'm going to head into the land of canine depression. So we'll be back in about two minutes. Thank you. But it's all about the signals that it's the dog is receiving. It's Amen. all signals. So it's always about the signals. And you know, we'll mention that when we come back off the break. There's no sixth sense, which is really cool because the ice the title of the show is I see dead people <laughs> <laughs> or dead beat people. Dead, dead beat people from the sixth sense. Uh you, you know, because when I was younger, I had an experience um that really kind of highlighted this whole thing and led me to believe that dogs know good or bad people. I was at the river with my dog and uh, a gentleman, I would call him a gentleman, but came up to me and, and you could tell that he was under the influence of whether it's alcohol or more, but he was very, very rude, very uh, kind of flamboyant as far as getting in my personal space and things like that. And my dog was very social dog, very, very social dog. But because of this guy's abnormal behaviors and things like that, my dog had a very strong response to him, mm -hmm. um, very strong response. So it was it was kind of that moment of, oh, my gosh, maybe dogs can. But, you know, looking back at it with the intelligent eye that I have now, uh, the you know what eye, she was picking up. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've seen it with uh, again, you you train dogs for autism. Right. And we I've worked with children who had autism where they would strike at the dog, reach and grab the dog harshly and violently. And, um, yeah, the dog's going to react to that. Yep. It's, it's all about signals. And that's well, the, protection that's dogs aren't, they can't tell if someone is a bad person. They're looking for specific movements, specific actions, and that's how they know to protect. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I tell the story. I even wrote about it in, in the blog. I wrote about the uh, remote training callers uh, about, okay.
All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, before we went on break, we we're talking about whether dogs can tell if you are what if they have an innate moral compass, innate moral code. Um, they probably have something that is more if you were a dog and you lived in a dog's body and in their mind and in their pack relationship, all we can go by, we've never been in their head. We can only go by their behavior. What kind of response do they give to any given signal? And a lot of that care, as you mentioned during the break, is all about signals. Yeah. It's all about signals. When I was a police canine officer, my dog had to bite a few people. And I certainly remember one man that he had to bite, uh, but this person was intoxicated. And a couple of years later, he came back to visit me holding a child. And he says, hey, I want to thank your dog and you for arresting me and your dog biting me and ca capturing me. Because, hey, I may have bled out that night because he had a severe injury for car wreck in which he was drinking and driving. Uh, but he had his little daughter and he'd gotten his college degree. He got his act together. He had a little daughter and he was, he was a good person. He really was. He made a, he made a mistake. We're humans and humans make mistakes. doesn't mean you're a bad person. doesn't mean you're nasty. doesn't mean you're rude. You made a mistake. And he came back and turned out to be good. But my dog attacked him because he operated off of a signal. And the man was acting very threateningly or actually tried to attack me. And, and Yager immediately went after him. And was able to apprehend him. So again, guys, what you do with this, that's up to you. If you have more questions on it, definitely reach out to us. I'll be glad to talk to you at length. Uh, and you can also uh, reach out to Joshua or even Kara. She can tell you all about this stuff here. So just reach out to us here, Brian with the Y at TamingTheWild.com. Okay. Now, one of the questions we had from the previous episode asked, uh, gave uh, in the question, told about a dog that she had that she adopted. And the dog is very timid around all new people very timid, slings, cringes, and it sleeps a lot. It just has a lot of uh, very lethargic, doesn't seem to be happy. So she asked, can dogs suffer from depression? Long story short, we don't know that answer. Uh, we're still trying to figure out why humans suffer from depression. And really, what is depression? We, but what we can tell you is what we know so far, which is a lot more now than even what we even knew five and 10 years ago. But kind of let me, let me go back just a little bit. Let's just do a little bit of a biology class. First of all, if humans and dogs suffer, these are things that we know, suffer from depression, then there's usually some sort of anxiety before the depression. So I believe that this dog is actually suffering from anxiety, not depression. Uh, it can always be traced back to genetics because there's always a genetic and neurochemical disorder. There always is, meaning you have many different genes. And so therefore you have gene Z and there's many variations of gene Z. But in your case, because you're suffering from this genetic neurochemical disorder, you're, that one particular variation becomes activated under one specific stimuli. Simple as that. Stimulus it becomes activated. And we don't know why that happens, but it does happen. But that being said, you're born. That just means you're predisposed. It means you have the capability of slipping into depression. Uh, we no longer say the apple fell far from the tree. The apple rub bark all the way down. Because we're learning about if your mother was, again, an addict, then you could be an addict. If uh, you had someone that suffered from a bipolar or depression, then, then you could certainly do the same. That could happen to you. There are genetic markers that we're learning. But we also know this, too. It all occurs from the stress response. But we mammals, in studying the biology of vulnerability to depression or anxiety is that you don't recover well from stressors. So again, we are used to welcome to the world. If you're a wolf, you're stressed because you're hungry. You've got offspring that are 30 kilometers back in that over a very steep hill and you haven't eaten for three days and your, your cubs are hungry. You're stressed. It's freezing cold out here. It's 40 below zero. Right now, I'm stressed because it's 100 degrees where it is here. We were designed to take on stress, whether you're predator or prey. We have the biology to get over it. So we call these mild to moderate transient stressors. Transient. They come, we absorb them, we deal with it, we get over it. That's the biology of stressors. 
you're going to activate and mobilize your stress response for many things. The only thing that makes this really different from mammals, other mammals with the stress response, is that we can mobilize ours strictly from a thought. We can do it from a thought. You can sit there and think, oh, I got an interview next week and I'm all nervous. Or I have to go see the dentist and I'm really dreading that. Oh my gosh, look at all this traffic. I'm never going to make it to work on time. And here we are. We mobilize our stress response just from a thought, from anticipatory stressors. No animal is capable of doing that. And so therefore, you're born with this genetic and neurochemical disorder. You will have stress in your life. So here it comes. So you get stressed. But here's the problem. The, those type of animals and humans, the more prior history or stress you have, especially early in life, the less of a stressor it takes to produce those neurochemical changes. So now I have to look at this dog. And again, one of the questions I had asked was, how old is this dog? So a young puppy taken, already predisposed, already has this variation of gene Z, so on and so forth, stress the puppy out. How? There's 50 million ways that you can stress out a puppy. Take it away from its litter. Uh, big stressor. Take it away from its mother. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die for sure. Uh, put it in a new household with new dogs and furless bipeds. I've never been around these things my whole life, but only one of them. Uh, you bet. There are a lot of ways that you can stress a young dog. Now, remember, these dogs don't get over it very well. So this starts to build. This does, and it causes neurochemical changes within the animal. Uh, and when this happens, and I'm not going to go into that, there's all sorts of things, brain neurons and neurotransmitters, a little chemical messenger. When the neuron gets super, super excited about something, it sends a little electrical message uh, wave over to the next neuron and to maybe a few other neurons. It does that through synapses and dendrites. Uh, and it takes advantage of chemical messengers known as serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, so on and so forth to talk to that other neuron. But we do know this. When these animals or even humans who aren't predisposed and other animals are constantly under prolonged stress. Remember, we were designed to deal with mild to moderate stressors, transient stressors. But when we have prolonged stressors, what we call pathological stress every day, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. You never allow your body to recover. You never recover. And over a period of time, that is extremely harmful. And next thing you know, synapses disappear. They atrophize. We have dendrites that curl up like the little vines on a grape plant. And they, they can't communicate to the other neurons. And then the other neurons can, can die. They can actually die. And when this happens, your ability to assimilate the information coming into your head is not possible to assimilate it properly. And here comes anxiety. Now, anxiety is mostly the realm of the amygdala. It's uh, when you're dealing with stressors and you're dealing with uh, animals who could possibly have depression, then that's going to be more akin in the in the uh, the realm of the hippocampus and the cortex. But the amygdala, wow, that thing's an important part of your brain because it is what is one of the first centuries out there on guard for any sort of danger, any sort of danger. So what is anxiety? You know, how does the amygdala kind of create it? Just real quickly, what is anxiety? It's a sense of disquiet, uh, like shifting sands below your feet. You, you, you just feel there's something wrong. I, I, can't, I don't, can't put my finger on it, but there's something wrong. And the reason why that is that typically when you have an anxiety type issue, when the amygdala has picked it up, if you've suffered any sort of trauma, any trauma whatsoever above that mild to moderate line. So either a one event, two or three events, or a prolonged event, like children that are abused when they're growing up, soldiers who go to war and they see the carnage of war for months on end. When you have this happening, then you start to, the way the stress response reacts to this is it actually starts to damage the brain. It starts to cause the hippocampus to become smaller. It, it damages it. And the hippocampus, think of it, it's kind of like a keyboard. Uh, your cortex is the hard drive on a computer. It stores all these memories, these declar uh, declarative memories that we can remember someone's birthday, when our anniversary is, and so on and so forth. And the hippocampus, that little keyboard that inputs information into that and then pulls it out. So that's this little job. But under, under anxious situations, we start 
causing our bodies to react in many ways. And one of those is an increase, and you mentioned earlier about it, a raise, uh, uh, higher levels of glucocorticoids. The, the little hormone that is there to kind of calm you down just a little bit. But when we have too much of those, again, it starts becoming harmful. And this is the result of your, you perceiving a threat, prolonged stressors, so on and so forth. Now, all of a sudden, you do get attacked by someone. You're a human. You have this one big stressor. I got attacked. This person attacked me. They threatened me with a knife. And it really scared me really bad. And next thing you know, a year later, I just happened to be at an outing. And while I'm talking to Kara, suddenly my heartbeat starts building just rapidly. And I'm breathing and I'm panting. And all of a sudden, Kara can ask, Brian, what's wrong with you? And I may say, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't feel good. And a lot of people are mistaken that, oh, that dude having a heart attack? What's happening with him? But what's happened is that the amygdala picked up a voice. A voice that sounds just like the voice of the person who attacked you. So, it was aware of a possible threat before you were consciously aware of it. So when we see dogs, you know, it, you know, one thing that we had to take in mind as well, that mammals can get anxious about anything. Uh, we can. We, we can create our own anxiety. But there are some things that are innate. For example, that young puppy, separation, separation from his pack. It's innate. I'm going to be afraid. That's why puppies howl when you put them in a crate initially. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. And then other things are learned. Uh, dogs learn to be afraid of unfamiliar people, unfamiliar dogs, unfamiliar places, storms, vocal tones, certain gestures. They learn this just like monkeys learn to be afraid of snakes. They're taught this. They're not born. So some things are implicit and some things are explicit. Implicit means, hey, you can have implicit learning, but there's also innate. And so therefore, anxiety can be associated with a trauma and then it can then after the trauma can be generalized based on similarity to something associated with the trauma. Uh, and then it just gets down into where you have a conditioned response like Pavlovian learning, just like Pavlov's dog, certain tone and also in the salivary glands become activated. So I believe that this dog is actually suffering from anxiety. It is something in its amygdala is saying there's a threat when all these people are giving these friendly gestures, they're approaching your home, they're coming over. It has an autonomic conditioned response. Its body takes over and treats the situation like it's a threat, whether it is or not. And now all this lethargy, this is nothing more than an exhausted animal who is now starting to suffer from depression-like symptoms of psychomotor retardation and so on and so forth. A, a lack of dopamine and, and everything where now I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to move. I'm exhausted. You know, they did a recent study in which they, you know, how you always, you go to these anger management classes and they say, Brian, count to 10 first, calm down, suffer in silence. Well, you know what they found out? Those who bent, those who say, hey, and they bent, they're actually healthier. Their resting levels of glucocorticoids are lower than those who hold it in who hold it in. Dogs do suffer in silence. If you hold it in, you become this tightly wound spring. So tight, so wound, so very tight. There's no way to let the spring relax, to get out. And unfortunately, that's what dogs are. Just, just by nature, they suffer in silence, many of these dogs do. So what can be done if you have a dog like that? Well, first of all, we do, the dog does have to be evaluated. You have to determine, okay, what is going on here? Is this a generalized anxiety disorder where there's many factors, many things that come into play? Or is it just one? Because that's what PTSD would be, one specific trauma. And now I react to anything similar to that specific trauma. And that's why we have medications. And a dog like this sounds like it does need to go on a medication that can heal its brain, develop new neurons, create new neurons, make those synapses healthy, Make sure that the neurochemical messengers, the neurotransmitters are not being depleted. Once this happens, now the animal has a chance. At least I have a healthy brain. And once I have a healthy brain, I can, I can come out of it. You know, they've also done research in rats in which they actually disconnected the amygdala from the hippocampus. And when they did that, these animals didn't no longer had the depression-like symptoms or the anxious-like symptoms at all. It's quite amazing. Um, welcome to the brain. But anyway, that was a long story. Didn't necessarily mean to go 
go that long in it, but it's just a breadcrumb trail. Dogs suffer in silence. Humans that do so are tightly wound springs, which leads to exhaustion, which leads to an increase of resting levels uh, of glucocorticoids, which is a hormone that's released during the stress response, which then can lead to depression. I'm never going to get over this. So for this animal, I'm always afraid. There's always people around. I hear people. I smell them. They're always over. I'm always around them. And there you have it. So me, if this were my dog, I'm going to get some help for it. I am. It's just, it definitely sounds like this dog needs some medications. Okay. So I hope that helped that guys. This is what I do. It's what I do for my living. <laughs> uh, on my day job, no, <laughs> doing, a radio, doing a radio show. But if you have any questions, please reach out to me. If you, you don't, your dog doesn't have to suffer as much. Uh, we don't use the word cure in this business. We use negotiated settlement. Um, but that means that we can, in most cases, achieve a higher quality of life and safety for dogs and humans. All right. Well, now I'm ready for other questions. Well, let's get going then. We don't have much time left. Well, we'll I mean, we can at least get one or two done. <laughs> okay. A couple of days ago, when my six-month-old puppy was eating. I reached down to pick up a towel that had fallen on the floor by his food bowl. He totally shocked me by growling and showing his teeth when I was near his bowl. I can't have a dog that's aggressive. What can I do to make sure he doesn't do that again? See why she was shocked. You know, most of us, again, a six month old puppy, you're thinking, oh, it's just a baby. Yeah. When was the last time a toddler took a swing at you when you reached over to grab their spaghetti <laughs> or, or anything? <laughs> so, yeah, I get the I'm shocked, you bet. But uh, again, what do we do about it? First of all, don't be shocked. Uh, why do you think at four weeks of age, wolf cub bites another wolf cub, dog pup tries to reach out and bite another dog pup? Why do they have such sharp little teeth. We call them milk teeth. So well, one of them is to save their mother from reverse vacuum and suckling and won't go down that road. But the other one is to determine who are you, who am I? Pain motivates because that innate thing that they have tells them we're about to come off of this faucet and go into a limited food supply. So even at four weeks of age, young wolf cubs and dog pups are already starting to find out what those little teeth do. So don't think for a second they're not going to use those to acquire, again, the number one thing, the number one reason for aggression on the planet Earth. I've said it a million times. I write about it. The evolutionary rule of mine, competitive aggression. So when the towel landed near it, let's just get rid of the towel. Who cares about the darn towel? It was the response of the human now reaching Again, again, go back to our personal part of the segment here. They they respond off of signals. I'm reaching, but how does the dog take that? It, again, I don't give a hoot about your stinking towel. The fact is your hand is right near my food bowl. So again, competitive aggression. So what do you do about it? I always tell people in advice, pick battles big enough to matter, small enough to win. All right. So meaning if your dog is willing to growl at you, which means I'm telling you back off. Get out of my little feeding zone here. If you, should you fail to do so, I may have to take and raise the single just a little bit and make you back off. Knowing that, my experience has been any dog that was willing to do that to its owner loves its food. And that food is gone in about 15 to 30 seconds. Problem solved. It's over. Once the, the resource is gone, then there's no need to fight over it. It's, it's tucked safely in my stomach. <laughs> so I don't need to worry about it anymore. I mean, again, you watch dogs at a dog park, throw a tennis ball. Watch dogs go after rawr, 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 all this sort of stuff, and one runs off with it. And the remaining dogs all go, um, you got another ball? <laughs> Do you have a second one? So can you throw it? Yeah, competitive aggression, at least the nice thing about it, it is the least violent uh, in, in the beginning, meaning I'm only going to use aggression to accomplish one goal. Whatever that is I was fighting you for, once I get it, I'm kind of done with you. I need to go eat my, my food now and you can just back off. Uh, so me, I'm probably going to take this little, I'm going to feed my puppy somewhere else, or I'm going to put that food bowl down and I'm going to walk away for about 30 seconds and go do something else and then come back and simply pick up the food bowl. Uh, I'm not going to fall for some of these other things that we've had people mention to us, like rub my hands all in my dog's food bowl. This is what someone that works at a pet food store told a client of ours. Oh, yeah. just rub your, rub your hands all in it. And if you rub your hands all in it, then your dog will smell you, 
your scent all over the food will know that you prepared for me. Again, I'm judging you as a good person or a bad person. Here we go. <laughs> and I will be forever grateful for you giving me this food. And now no way would I ever bite you after that. And then, and then we have TV personalities telling you to eat out of your dog's food bowl. You personally in front of your dog so they get to see it eat out of your dog's food bowl. And where were they going with that? What were they trying to, what were they trying to say? What, what message were they sending to the dog? Mine. It's mine. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Dog. All right. Well, our client tried that and, uh, <laughs> it and didn't work out. He so had well. a huge bandage on his nose. <laughs> yes, uh, he did. And this, it's an animal. It's not a little human. So me, I'm just gonna feed the dog somewhere else. I tell you what, if I have to be busy in the kitchen, why don't you just go eat over here? They don't really care where that darn bowl is. They just care what's in the darn bowl. I'm going to do that. And if I really want to get proactive, then I can do things, for example, hey, out. So spit my food out and you back off over here. You lay down, you stay. Now let me move this bowl or whatever. You can definitely be more proactive. But I'm here to tell you this right now. If you think just because your dog does great obedience, does all these great behaviors for you, that you're not going to have an issue with food, you're going to find out the hard way. And I'm trying to spare you from that. I'm trying to save you from yourself. Food aggression needs to be taken extremely, it, it, very seriously. It just yeah. does. You need to give extreme attention to it. And if there are really small children in the household, it's probably best to feed the dog in the crate. Just keep everyone safe. Yeah. Or a, another room, a laundry room yeah. or somewhere where the, where the child will go in and accidentally open up the door. Um, I also wanted to address in this question, it does say, I can't have a dog that is aggressive. I think it's, it needs to be said that this is any dog is capable of acting this way. You're, you do not have an aggressive dog. You simply have a dog period. Yeah. It's acting is exactly how we would almost anticipate it to act. Well, humans can, can actually, again, we, we've been blessed and so many humans have been blessed to have all the food that they want. So they don't get it, but I've been to countries and, and there, there's a reason why Mahatma Gandhi said that bread to a starving man, bread is the face of God. They, you can't threaten them with prison. Oh, please throw me in. I'll give up my freedom just so I can eat. I, I've seen violence over small portions of food. Mm -hmm. This is us. We are all governed by the law of limited resources. So you let America start running out of food. Oh yeah, we're running out. I well, don't think for a second we're not going to give a little sideways glance to our neighbors. Hmm, we just may need to take that place over. Think about every war. So again, competitive aggression, either A, put that food bowl somewhere safe, just let it go. Your dog will be a completely different animal after that is over with. Uh, and then keep, keep a lookout, make sure that that kind of aggression doesn't roll into now treats, now into toys, now into anything in my mouth. That's when I'm going to get proactive and teach, hey, out. Drop it when I say so, drop it, leave it, whatever. When I give you that command, you have an automatic response to that command. You spit it out, and I'm going to move you away from the object. Take it. Take control of the situation, and there we go. Yep. Captain can spit something out of his mouth faster than I've ever seen any dog spit something out. Yeah, he, It's amazing. Oh, yeah. That's an autonomic response, kind of like the dog slinking with all the people <laughs> I talked about. It really is. It truly is. Uh, again, if you're driving, if you happen to be talking on your phone while you're driving, do Don't you have do to, it. again, do you, you know, but. Do you have to consciously say, hey, give me a second here. Hey, put, get off the gas and press the brake. No. Once you do something more than a few times, it starts becoming a conditioned response. Boom. It happens just like that. And the blink of an eye and captain definitely does that. Okay. Second question. I have a four-year-old blue healer mix that I want to take off leash. We've been working with an e-collar, but it seems to be making him anxious. Have you ever seen that before? Am I doing something wrong? Yes, I have seen that before. And amazing that we use the word anxious uh, after what we just talked about. One of the outside of stressors, if you want to create a, a well, no, I, actually, let me rephrase that. If you want to create a stressor in a mammal, put them in a position where they have no control or predictability of the outcome. There you go. Snap my fingers right now and you suddenly find yourself teleported to a foreign country where you don't know what the language is, where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, what you should or shouldn't eat, what culture would be considered 
rude or aggressive. And you, by golly, are going to be anxious. The biggest issue we have with remote training callers and e-callers uh, is the fact that most dogs aren't trained how to control the signal, how to control it. How do I make sure it doesn't come on? How, what do I, what response do I give? No one's afraid of a minefield in which you can see all the mines. That's the biggest problem. Most people get them and they think they bought a remote control and therefore they put on the dog and the dog doesn't do action A, then he gets signal B. Uh, no, the animal must learn, okay, what is that? And they really honestly don't have to learn what it is, but they have to learn how to make it go away and how to make it not come on at all. And if you fall short in your training, you push that training too soon, uh, then yes, you have an anxious animal because it cannot control the outcome of the signal. I can't interpret it and then I can't control it. That is the fastest way I know to send you down a rabbit hole uh, is not having control of your fate, of anything, the outcome. I, I can't do it and I can't even predict it. The the anxious part of all of this, you know, we we see that often in dogs when we first initially introduce the remote collar, like you said. But if you stay consistent with it, don't shy away just because your dog is, is showing a little bit of nervousness towards the remote collar. Once they get it, if you stay consistent in its application, the dog will eventually go, ah, got it. I, I know how to do this. Yeah, I that's a good point. Confidence. You know, they, dogs are, again, I was born with innate uh, learning. I already have it. We, we talked about it last time. Um, you know, um, phylogenetic, uh, plasticity, so on and so forth, phenotypical type, uh, information that they have. They're born with this. They they're born, but then the other things that they learn and in the process of learning, sometimes there's anxiety. I've had, I've been anxious about learning something new many times going, Oh God, I'll never get this in a million years. I don't care how much you try. I'm never going to get this and I'm going to fail miserably. And Hey, when I started getting it, I wasn't so anxious. And you were more confident. Nobody, yeah. nobody wants to play a dogs? game they can't win at. Yeah. And that's, that's where it kind of comes all down to. If I can win at the game, heck, I want to play all day. Yeah. That's why I love about obedience if it's done right. You simply give the animal all the control. All the control you get. All right, guys. Uh, we're not going to get to that third question. We'll I promise. save it for next week. We'll get to it next week. Hey, next week, tune in. We Have you ever left your dog, whether it be you know, at a boarding facility or whether it someone who sits your dog while you're gone. But have you ever wondered, does my dog miss me? I think you, a lot of people have wondered that. Yeah, I, I get asked that regularly. So I know a lot of people yeah. wonder that. And will my dog forget me? What, does that happen? Do dogs really miss us? So we're going to be covering that next week, a whole bunch of questions. Uh, but in the meantime, Joshua, where can they find us? Where can they check uh, us out? Follow us on Facebook. If you haven't already subscribe to our YouTube um, hit the notification bell so you get notified when we put out our little videos, our skits, and things like that. <laughs> um, and then you can follow us, uh, get a little bit behind the scenes of here at Taming the Wild on our Instagram. Yeah, I promise to give you the cash back, by the way. You guys haven't checked out our little video skits. Uh, well, at least we think they're funny. I don't care. You know, again, laugh at your own we joke. We do it for us. Not and we laugh at ourselves. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. Uh, are we still live? Yes. Yep. We're live. Hey, if you've been watching this episode and listening to us, appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, reach out to us. If you have any suggestions, well, ears again, we, we do practice what we preach. We try to go into every situation with an open mind. There's nothing closed. Uh, new evidence, the absence of evidence. And now all of a sudden the, doesn't mean that there's a, the evidence of absence. It, that's absolutely true. And every situation has to be approached that way. And it's what we try to do here. Go into it with an open mind. I had never, I didn't even know this little research had been done. I had no clue until I read this in a magazine. So I'm like, hmm, okay. Well, of course, right off the bat, I was a little biased. I'm just going to be honest with you because I'm going, wait a minute. The dogs know, they, they think I'm rude? Huh? Do they, uh, are they just, am I a nasty person if they growl at me? You know, and then you start asking all sorts of little questions and then you have to be careful about, are you answering your own questions, Brian? And so on and so forth. <laughs> uh, so no, then we hopped into it and did the research and really dug deep into it. Got it. In, um, dang, the darn thing cost me 60 bucks just to download the research. 
Uh, but got into it and yeah, so I was going to make sure it's worth the money. Absolutely. And hopefully you guys did too. And that's just what we do here. So if you have had any other suggestions, you want us to talk about a particular subject that you have, uh, that you think would be important for pet owners, let us know. We really want to hear from you. We want to interact with you because we are here for you. What you do with the information is really up to you. We're just going to throw it out there because we've been doing this for a long time and I bled a lot in a lot of ways, and we're just here to try and make sure you don't bleed, or at least not as much. So we love having you guys here. Guys, have a wonderful week. Hopefully, wherever you are, by this time next week, the temperatures will be cooler. Global warming will take a little bit of a break, because I could certainly use a break. And hopefully, we'll be sitting here looking out the window going, man, can we go do this show outside? That would be so nice. It would be. All right, guys, you guys add anything to add? Yeah, anybody uh, new that's uh, tuning in live, don't forget that Kira and I are both sitting here waiting for uh, questions. If you guys hear us talk about something that you want Brian or anybody to elaborate on a little bit, let us know, and and we'll we'll get that information over to Brian. Yeah, and if I can't answer it, I'll get it over to them. When does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's happened before. <laughs> I've got stuck and tripped over my own words a few times. And, you know, it's nothing worse than you're sitting there going, I know this word, but I can't come up with this word right at this moment. And said this word a thousand times, but oh, the yeah. thousand and one. It's yeah. Not and that's welcome <laughs> to your stress response because when that happens, again, with mild to moderate stressors, your, your memory is actually enhanced. How did I get out of this situation? How did I get out of it last time? What do I do now? But with a severe stressor, or prolonged stressor. So maybe it's just, I get so far into the show, I'm 40 <laughs> minutes into it and I'm going, that's a prolonged stressor. Yeah. Uh, now your memory is not so enhanced. It's uh, actually uh, disrupted. So you can't recall like you used to. Maybe that's what's going on. Or maybe just flat out dementia or, or I'm just getting old. I'm not sure. Could be anyone. All right, I'll guys, talked long enough. We're getting the heck out of here. We got other things we got to get done around here. Have a great week. We'll see you then.